Okay, uh, so obviously uh, we've been talking about uh, gases and gas laws, and uh, yesterday we focused in on a couple of things. Uh, we focused in on uh, sort of gas stoichiometry. Uh, so remember when we do gas stoichiometry, uh, it's pretty much kind of the same steps that we follow and sort of basic stoichiometry problems. Um, it just means that somewhere along the way, you will kind of use the ideal gas law. Uh, we talk about two, really two places where you can use it. Uh, first off is sort of the uh, second step when we convert to moles. When we convert to moles, um, you know, you could solve for N in the ideal gas law and then kind of continue the problem like a basic stoichiometry problem. A lot of times though, we do sort of use the ideal gas law on sort of the very last step. So uh, a lot of the sort of gas stoichiometry problems are sort of basic stoichiometry problems that instead of using say molar mass at the last step to convert the moles into grams or something like that, we're oftentimes interested when we're talking about gases, how much volume of gas that we collected. And we use the ideal gas law on the back end of the calculation, uh, solving for volume in that case. So that's a very, very common sort of steps in a gas stoichiometry problem is to actually use the ideal gas law there on the back end of the calculation. On the front end, a lot of times, like I said, uh, you may even be starting with grams and stuff like that. The other option is you could technically use the ideal gas law on both sides, uh, sort of a step number two to get the moles and also on the back end there to um, sort of calculate the volume. In addition, we talked about the idea that although uh, we didn't come across one here, you can also still again have, uh, you know, a limiting reagent type problem that involves gases. Um, we approach it the same way as normal. Um, you just need to determine the limiting reagent and solve for what it's asking for. We then moved into sort of the idea of partial pressures. And we talked about really uh, three different sort of situations where our calculations, I guess, of sort of partial pressure type situations. The first one is just a straight, uh, you're given uh, information about uh, two or more gases that are flying around in the same container. Remember sort of uh, part of what makes something an ideal gas is you could almost assume that uh, even though there are other gases sort of flying around with them in the container, um, that they'll have really no interaction with one another. And what that means is essentially, if you have enough information given to you, you basically could solve for pressure in the ideal gas law for each gas separately. Uh, and that's what's referred to as partial pressures because we have multiple gases flying around in the same container. They're each contributing to the overall pressure of that container. And that is why they're called partial pressures. Once you basically solve the ideal gas law for each of the gases individually, you simply add up all the pressures that you got there, all the partial pressures and that will basically give you the total pressure within the mixture. We also saw that uh, in certain cases, you may not have uh, enough information to actually kind of go into the ideal gas law. And that is where we uh, sort of saw the uh, other formula that you can use for partial pressures where, you know, you got the partial pressure, it's the mole fraction times the total pressure. So this is one where, if you're not given, you know, for example, temperatures, um, volumes and things of that nature, but you are given enough information to figure out the moles of each gas present. And you're given really one sort of pressure information. So either you're given one of the partial pressure informations, uh, you're given basically the total pressure information from that uh, information of with the moles and that one piece of pressure information you can use this formula here and really solve for everybody else. Um, remember that the mole fraction is really um, kind of like a percentage of the moles that are present without multiplying by 100. So you take the moles of what you're interested in divided by the moles of or the total moles that are present. And again, no multiplying by 100 there. And that will give you the mole fraction. And the third and very, very common sort of uh, situation of sort of partial pressures that occurs, especially uh, in experiments and laboratory and stuff like that is a situation where the gas is sort of collected over water or water sort of involved in the collection of the gas. So we saw a couple of pictures, I think, of a situation where we were generating a gas 
And basically the gas was collected in a container. That container originally had water in it. So as the gas came in that we were interested in, it basically displaced the water from the container and left sort of a empty spot in that container. That empty spot in that container is really not empty. As we talked about, it contains the gas that you're interested in. But as sort of a byproduct of that uh, process, it also contains water vapor. And again, just the process of doing it, the heat, the reaction is going to generate some water vapor in there. So in that situation, we're not really interested usually at all in the water vapor. We're really interested in the gas we collected. So we get a sort of partial pressure situation where the total pressure is equal to the pressure of the gas we're interested in plus the vapor pressure of water And again, as I mentioned, this is typically a value that you can look up in a table. And um, basically it becomes kind of a subtraction problem really. So it's not too bad. So we want to kind of the pressure of just the gas by itself without the contribution of water vapor to it. We basically subtract off the water vapor from the total pressure, which again, in a sort of lab situation, uh, you would get the total pressure from the barometer reading for the room. Uh, in a book, obviously, they usually will give you that sort of situation. So those are three different, again, sort of situations uh, where we've come across sort of partial pressures, mixtures of pressures. And again, they're all similar, but a little bit different in terms of the aspect of how you kind of calculate them. Any questions on any of that stuff we talked about last time? Okay, then we're going to kind of continue on here where we left off and I believe it is this next slide here. So we sort of talked about some of these uh, concepts, but this is basically the kinetic molecular theory of gases and it basically describes sort of, you know, what sort of happening in the gases. It also points out a couple of those uh, situations that we talked about previously that basically is what makes something an ideal gas. Uh, so first off, the first sort of part of it is that a gas is composed obviously of very small uh, molecules that are separated uh, from each other by distances greater than their own dimensions. And basically what that is considered is we kind of consider these gas molecules um, as sort of points. And what we consider is because of that, because sort of the distances are greater than their own volume, <clears throat> we consider that really these gas molecules possess a negligible volume. So this right here, this negligible volume is what we were talking about sort of earlier, why we consider something sort of an ideal gas. Um, when we think about again a lot of the problems that we've seen or a lot of problems that you do see you know a lot of times they do refer to sort of the volume of the container which the gases are in again rather than the volume of the gas itself and that's because of this sort of this idea that you know based on sort of where they're flying around the volume at which they're flying around and it is relatively much larger than the actual gas molecules themselves uh, gas molecules are obviously in constant motion and direction. They frequently collide with each other. As they collide with each other, obviously that is sort of, you know, what we assume causes the pressure that occurs. Uh, collisions among mo uh, molecules are perfectly elastic. You know, they're really not sort of attracted to each other. They're bouncing off each other and they're doing a, a pretty good job as they kind of float around the container. Gas molecules exert neither ex attractive or repulsive forces to one another. And that's really the second thing here that makes something an ideal gas. So these two things here are really the two things for the kinetic molecular theory that really make, again, something considered an ideal gas. And sort of what happens under normal sort of situations of temperature and pressure. Uh, there's no attractive forces or repulsive forces from one another under an ideal situation. And that's why what we just did and just talked about yesterday, when we're doing sort of those partial pressures where we have all these different gases sort of flying around, 
in the same container. Again, we could assume that each gas, even though they're there, will pretty much not interact with other gases. So we could kind of think about them as being in that container by themselves, which is why we can, when we do a partial pressure type problem, use the ideal gas law individually for each gas and solve it individually like they were there by themselves. And so those are the, really the two things that make something sort of an ideal gas. As we'll talk about here at the end of this chapter, that it doesn't hold true when we talk about something that's referred to as a real gas, unlike the fake gases we've been talking about. Uh, but real gases, when we have really sort of high pressures and low temperatures, those two things you do have to take into account. So you do have to take into account the size of the gas molecule, and you do have to take into account the interactions between different molecules, because as we'll talk about in those situations, the gas molecules are very close to one another, so they are going to interact with each other. So you may think about like, what would that affect? Well, if we have in an ideal situation, sort of a gas molecule that can just fly and it's free basically to fly and hit the container, even though there's another gas molecule maybe near it. And sort of a real gas situation, you know, as it's flying to hit the container, maybe these two gas molecules feel an attractive force to one another, or even maybe a repulsive force. And that may create some drag and allow it to kind of move into the container a little bit slower because it's kind of being dragged back by an attractive force. Could even make it go a little faster in some situations by a repulsive force, but it will affect sort of the collisions and the pressure that we would see in those sort of real gas situations. We'll talk about that in just a second. So those two things out of the kinetic molecular theory, negligible volume of the gas, basically no volume itself, and attracted or repulsive forces between different gas molecules are not felt are again two things that make something an ideal uh, sort of gas. The average kinetic energy of a molecule uh, is proportional to the temperature. Again, if we sort of, we talked a little bit about that, you know, if we increase the temperature, we do expect the gas molecules to move faster and vice versa. Obviously, if we decrease the temperature, we would expect sort of a slowdown. So you should know the, the points here of the kinetic micro theory. Again, you should know the two things that are really part of it that makes something an ideal gas law, which again is that negligible volume and attractive and repulsive force is not really occurring. Any questions on that there? And again, just uh, some of these things that we obviously have talked about when we talked individually about our gas laws and sort of how our kinetic marker theory applies to it. We saw earlier, just a review, right, that uh, uh, Boyle's law, um, basically we get that opposite uh, relationship, that inverse relationship. Again, as the pressure goes up, we do see a decrease in the volume and vice versa. Um, Charles law is related to temperature. So what we saw with Charles law, right, is that in order to sort of keep the constant pressure, the volume will adjust as the temperature goes up the volume will go up and as temperature goes down, the volume will go down. Again, that's able to keep really the pressure constant. In sort of Guy Lussac's situation, we don't have that adjustment happening. Thus, we uh, do see an increase in pressure uh, when we do increase the temperature and we see a decrease in pressure when we lower the temperature. We also, again, talked about Avogadro's law and again, Avogadro's law, really that sort of pressure is proportional to the number of gas molecules and that's sort of the volume and, um, and number of moles sort of move equally to each other in that sense. Again, in a Avogadro situation, we have constant pressure and temperature. One way we need to sort of ensure that we are keeping a constant pressure is if we sort of increase the volume, we will see an increase in the number of moles of gas again, to keep those collision rates up and keep the pressure constant and vice versa. If we see sort of a decrease in the volume, we will see a decrease in the number of gas molecules, again, to keep the pressure constant. And again, sort of that application of no attractive or repulsive forces, as we talked about with our partial pressures, is even though we may have a mixture of several gases within a container, because there is no attraction or repulsive forces with one another, 
we really can think of them as being there individually and individually sort of contributing to the overall pressure of that container. And again, that's how we get our partial pressures, obviously, and adding them together. It's just an apparatus so you can measure sort of uh, how fast or slow uh, the speed of molecules are. Uh, you have an, an oven where you had your samples and obviously it gets shot sort of through there as it's spinning. You know, the slower molecules will be at one point, average sort of speed and a lot faster molecules will hit it really quick as it goes through there. So what we're going to talk about now is sort of the effect of speed, if you will, and temperature and how fast gas molecules are basically moving. So if we look at these guys here, this first graph on top is a graph of nitrogen gas. And this is nitrogen gas at three different temperatures, 100, 300 K and 700 uh, Kelvin. And what we see here is when we look at the same gas molecule, but we increase the temperature, we basically see an increase in the molecular speed, which is here in meters per second. And we see that by just looking really at each of the curves. And what we're looking really is the peak of the curve and basically kind of going back down. If I drew it straight, it would be sort of its speed at 100. When we increase it to 300, we can see that you know, the speed starts to move a little bit faster. And obviously when we increase it to 700, the average speed obviously moves a lot faster as you go down. So we see uh, that as we increase the temperature, as we would expect, the gas molecules basically gain a lot more energy, which means they're able to move around a lot faster because of that. Now, when we look at different gas molecules at the same temperature. So the deal here is we're all at the same temperature here, 300 Kelvin in this case, but we have different gas molecules. We got chlorine, nitrogen, and helium. And if we look at sort of the speed here for chlorine, you know, it's about there. Average sort of speed there is about there. And we see helium, you know, average is over here. And what we see is chlorine is moving a lot slower than helium and nitrogen is moving a lot slower than uh, helium as well. So what is sort of the factor, the difference that we see between these things? And the difference is we see our molar masses. So when we look at sort of the weight or the mass of each of these guys, we see that helium is the lightest and is moving the fastest. While chlorine is the heaviest and is moving the slowest. So the lighter the gas molecule, the faster it's going to be moving versus the uh, heavier gas molecule that is going to be moving a lot slower. What does that affect? Well, if you remember back when we did sort of our uh, partial pressure problem, uh, when we had, I think uh, it was helium and neon, I think, right? When it's helium and neon. When we looked at the partial pressures of each of these guys, I think the total pressure was something like 14.7, if I'm not mistaken. And I believe, uh, go off the top of my head here, I think helium was something like 12.3 atmospheres in our particular problem we looked at, and maybe neon was 2.44 atmospheres in that problem. Go off the top of my head, hope for the best, with a total pressure of 14.7. So in comparisons of helium and neon, we have helium that's, you know, like uh, we got there four grams per mole. We got neon, which is 20 grams per mole. We would expect neon to be moving a lot slower because it's moving slower. We see less of a, contrib a contribution in terms of pressure because there's less collisions occurring than helium that's moving around a lot faster. We could actually calculate 
the speed at which a gas molecule is traveling or the velocity really at which a gas molecule is traveling. And this down here is what is known as the root mean square velocity. So this is the root mean square velocity. And this is basically how fast a uh, gas molecule is traveling. When we use this formula, which is the square root of three times R, which is the gas constant, and our temperature, which is in Kelvin, and our molar mass here, um, the units that we end up with is meters per second. So let's talk a little bit about some of these values here. R is the gas constant, but it is the gas constant that involves energy, which is 8.314 joules per Kelvin per mole. So that is the R that we see here. Remember that what we talked about was that a joule, and I think we saw this way early in the, one of the earlier chapters, is equal to a meter squared, second squared, I'm sorry, meters, kilogram, second squared. Can here. Got ahead of my writing there, try that again. Meter squared, second squared, and times kilogram. And what that means is if we put just the units into this formula here and just look at the units, uh, for our R, we would substitute in for a joule, meter squared, seconds, keep on our into second squared in the wrong spot, kilograms, there we go, meter squared, kilograms, That again okay so that is the joule part that we see here and now we obviously have kelvin and mole from the rest of r so that is all sort of the values of r where we took out joules and put in meter squared kilograms second squared and temperature obviously is going to be in kelvin now molar mass is typically in grams per mole but the grams is not gonna work great here because we actually need it in kilograms per mole. So kind of similar to, I think it was the Broglie's wavelength where we kind of saw something like this. We would want kilograms per mole. That way, when we cancel out everything, the kilograms will cancel out correctly. The moles will cancel out correctly. The Kelvin will cancel out. And basically what we're left with when everything cancels out is the square root in terms of units of meter squared second squared. So obviously when we take the square root of that, we are left with the meters per second, which again is our root mean square velocity. The good news is much like the Broglie, the number is the same. Uh, and just the units is really for joules changes, but everything cancels out the same. Any questions on that one there? Okay, so why don't we try that? Let's try, um, let's try calculating a couple here. Let's do, um, why don't we do those two examples actually? Let's do, um, let's do neon and helium, which is I think that from that example we did earlier, and just to see why we see such a difference in the pressure. So why don't you calculate the root mean square velocity for helium and neon at, uh, we'll do 25 degrees Celsius. And again, uh, helium is uh, 4.003 grams per mole and neon is uh, 2018 grams per mole. And again, let's do the root mean, root mean square velocity in meters per second. All right, so take a couple of minutes and see what you come up with on this guy. Okay, uh, let's take a look at this one. So uh, we're looking for the root mean square velocity. And again, it's that formula that we just saw there on the NOS page, which is root mean square velocity square root of three RT divided by really the molar mass there. Uh, so we'll do it here for uh, helium first. So our root mean square velocity would be three times again our R, 
which is our 8.314, not the 0 0.082 that we've been using for everything else. Uh, again, that is joules, which is a meter squared kilogram second squared. Um, and that is a Kelvin mole on the bottom. And our temperature here, which is 25 degrees, which we need to add a 273 to gives us a 298 Kelvin. So that's a 298 Kelvin. And remember, because of this kilograms, that's really in the joules part. Uh, we do need to do the molar mass on the bottom there into kilograms. So we need to divide by a thousand or move the decimal place over three places gives us 0 0.004003 kilograms per mole. Again, everything's going to cancel out here in terms of the units, except for meters squared over second squared, which becomes meters per second when we do the square root of it. So if we do our math here, we end up with the square root and roughly we'll call it 1,363. 1,363, again, the units here would be meters per second. Any question on that calculation there? Now, if we do the same thing for our neon at the same temperature, the root mean square of our neon would be three times our 8.314. Still 298, even if they're in the same container there. And the molar mass here also converting it out into kilograms uh, per mole instead of grams per mole so that all the units cancel correctly, gets us 0 0.02018, and that gives us three times 8.314 times a 298, and we're dividing by 0 0.02018. Do a little square root action there. We end up, we'll call it uh, 607 meters per second. So we could see, you know, again, um, based on our calculation, why we saw in that partial pressure problem, for example, it came out again, I think it was, what was it there, 12, 12.3 12 atmospheres for helium, um, 2.44 atmospheres that we had in that particular problem for the partial pressure in neon. We could see that basically, if it was sort of this situation here, neon is traveling about half the speed that the helium molecules are traveling, which means in a mixture of those two, helium would be moving all around the place a lot faster than neon would. Again, contributing to more collisions because it's moving around a lot faster and a much higher partial pressure. Any questions on that? Roughly speaking, I think if you did some conversions there, you're looking at, uh, you know, something like uh, 3,000 miles per hour and versus uh, maybe 1,300 miles per hour um, in the ballpark there uh, for each of those things. So you can see it's significantly moving much, much faster, uh, the helium molecules than the neon molecules. Any questions on root mean square velocity? Again, much like a couple other things, we just want to be kind of careful as we sort of do the calculation um, about the units of things. Again, R, the good news is if you forget about the units, uh, still the same number, 8.314. So really it is in this particular formula here, the bottom guy that's of importance. You gotta make sure it's kilograms per mole. I guess R is important as well to remember that it's actually the 8.314 version of it and not uh, the 0 0.08206, which is again, commonly sort of used in a mistake in this sort of problem. Okay, we're gonna talk about a couple other things in terms of how gas molecules sort of moves around, if you will. Um, and one thing is was referred to as gas diffusion. And in gas diffusion, for example, uh, when we sort of get the gradual mixing of molecules of one gas molecule uh, by another, just based on their sort of kinetic properties. 
uh, we could actually calculate some things from that if we know r which is the rate at which is sort of traveling uh, the m's here are the molar mass and actually in this case you could leave it in grams per mole in this particular one again we're not doing anything with the gas constant or anything like that so r is rates so rate one over rate two equals the square root of the molar mass of the second gas molecule uh, versus the first gas molecule here so if we take a look at ammonia and we take a look at uh, hcl when they come together they do make ammonium chloride which is this kind of white smoke that's sort of happening over there and that's really the combination of the ammonia gas and the hydrogen chloride uh, gas basically coming together now when we look at this we do see something sort of interesting really the mixing is happening closer to the hydrogen chloride gas and why would that be well based on what we just talked about if we look at the molar mass of this guy and we look at the molar mass of this guy, we see that HCl is much heavier, right? HCl is heavier, which means we would expect that the HCl would be moving slower and that the NH3, which is lighter, would be moving faster. So basically as the NH3 comes out of here, it's able to move faster than the slower moving HCl. And what ends up happening is we get sort of that combination occurring closer to the slower moving side. And that's where all the occurring occurs or the mixing occurs of the ammonium chloride. So again, based on what we just talked about, if we were to calculate the root mean square velocities of both of these guys, we would probably and should probably see that the ammonia would be definitely traveling at a higher velocity than the hydrogen gas, hydrogen chloride gas. Thus, it's gonna find its way over there a lot quicker than the HCl that's slowly sort of coming out of the box there. And the mixing does occur uh, over there closer to our sort of slower moving guy. Any questions on that there? Now, another sort of uh, way that sort of gas molecules can sort of move as well is what is referred to as gas effusion. And gas effusion is the process by which uh, a gas that's under pressure escapes from one compartment to the next, hence the kind of little hole that we have here. So under pressure, some gas molecules are gonna basically pop out from one side to the next here through that little hole and that opening. We could also basically kind of basically incorporate the same formula that we saw over there by taking rate one over rate two is equal to our molar mass two or molar mass one are the time T2 over T1, the time it takes for one to do it versus the other. So if we look at an example like this, we could kind of use some of this information uh, to help us even figure out some unknown. And that is that nickel forms a gas compound that has a formula of NiCOx. Oops, NiCOx. What is the value of X? So we're looking for really what is the kind of the formula here, but we're really looking for what that number is. Given that under the same conditions, um, CH4 methane effuses 3.3 times as fast um, than the compound. So we basically have a couple of things. We have the molar mass, we could call number one, uh, we'll call that methane. And um, <clears throat> molar mass one of methane. So we would get that together, which is 12.01 plus four times 1.008 gives us a molar mass of 16.04 grams per mole. We know that rate one will then be 3.3 times as fast as basically rate two. 
So you got to do that, although we don't really know what the numbers are, we do know that it's 3.32 times as fast as rate one, I'm sorry, rate number two. M2 is what we're looking for. And rate two is, we don't really know what it is, but we know that it is sort of 3.3 uh, times as fast. So we can basically kind of put those guys into our formula here and we would get 3.3 R2 divided by R2 is equal to the square root. And again here, since I chose M1 as my methane, I want to do my M2 up on top, I'm not sure. And my M2 obviously would be my compound. And this guy would be 16.04 grams per mole. These two guys, again, we don't know the numbers, but we know they're the same, so they are going to cancel. And that means that we end up with 3.3 is equal to the square root of our compounds molar mass and our 16.04 grams per mole. We need to square both sides in this case to get rid of the square root. So if we take 3.3 and we do a little square action on it, gets us a 10.89 is equal to M2 16.04 grams per mole. To get the 16.04 to the other side, we're gonna multiply, which finally for our unknown compound gives us a molar mass of, we'll call it about 174.7 grams per mole. First off, any questions on that calculation? Sometimes people ask, does it matter which one you make M1 or M2? It really doesn't, as long as obviously in, when you're using this equation, you know, whatever one you call M2, for example, you need to make sure that if you're doing something with time, that that time stays up on top, or if you're doing something with rate, that the rate's on the bottom. They just kind of keep those pieces of information together, just like if you did M1, it'd be sort of the opposite route. So, you could, it'll work out the same, you know, if I called uh, CH4 uh, M2 and did this for R2 and so forth, um, you know, it will come out the same. You just need to make sure you keep kind of the time and rates, whichever one you're using, those numbers that go with the correct molar mass on the other side. Now, how does this help us get to sort of the formula here? It would work. It would work the same way. You would. Uh, the question was, how would you do it if you did it with M two? It would, it worked the same way, except that some things would be flipped around. So, for example, if you did uh, M one was your kind of unknown compound, that means that M one would have R one that goes with it. M two would be your sixteen point oh four, and your R2 in this case would be 3.3 times as fast as R1 in this case, right? Because that's the rate. So that's the difference. Again, these guys would cancel out. The only difference is you will end up with uh, one over 3.3 here, but these guys will also be flipped around as well. And that's why it will work out at the same when you're all done and you do the math. So you, know, you can do it either way, but it, you just got to make sure you keep those things together. Now to... Uh, now to answer sort of the real question here, which is really, you know, what is this formula? I'm gonna kind of go to the next page so we get a little bit more place to write, I think. Um, so we had uh, N, oops, N, I, C, O, X. And we had, in terms of the more mass, we calculated 170, was that guy there? 170 something there on my calculator. There go. Uh, <clears throat> I hit the wrong button there. Let's try it again. All right. So I had 174.7. There we go. 174.7 grams per mole is the molar mass of this unknown compound. So, what do we know about this compound for sure is we do know that we definitely have one nickel. No matter what happens, we have one nickel. And if we go to the periodic table and we look up nickel, uh, nickel there is 58, okay, you know, 5869. 
So the molar mass from the periodic table for nickel is 58.69, I think. So we know out of that 174, 58.69 is nickel. So 174.7 minus 58.69. That leaves us 116.01. And that 116.01 is basically made out of the CO units, right? And CO is basically one carbon and <clears throat> one oxygen. So if we add up the mass of molar mass of CO, which is sort of our unit that's there, we have 12.01 plus 16, and that gives us uh, 2801 grams per mole, which means if we take what's left, these are basically made up of a certain number of CO units, right? So if we take this number and we divide it by 28.01, we roughly get 4.14, which again, roughly here, we would round to four, which means that the missing part here was approximately four of those CO units. So you can see obviously something like this, we could use this information actually to calculate the missing sort of formula here based on how fast this unknown gas molecule kind of moves versus something that does uh, that is a known molecule. Any questions on that? Okay. So that is a gas effusion, gas diffusion. So to finish up sort of talking about gases here, we're now going to talk about, you know, sort of what happens when we deviate from ideal behavior. And we sort of uh, touched upon this a couple of times here with some of our, our conversations in this chapter, but this sort of behavior is what is sometimes referred to as real gases. Some people call it non-ideal gases, but a lot of people call them real gases. And real gases do deviate from ideal gases in, in several reasons. And again, these are usually situations where we start to see very high pressures and kind of low temperatures. So at very high pressures and kind of low temperatures, we start to see this sort of deviation from ideal sort of situation. So if we look at an ideal gas law and we solve it for N, the ratio of pressure times volume R to T in an ideal situation, as you can see, is sort of a perfect one type of situation. We see that as we increase the pressure here to very high pressures, we start to see a lot of deviation happening for these gas molecules. And they're not really behaving like ideal gas under these conditions. So when we have these conditions of really high pressures and low temperatures, we get this sort of situation. So think about what we talked about, for example, with Boyle's law and when we get high pressure or as the pressure goes up, what happens to the volume? As the pressure goes up, the volume goes down, right? So if you think about it in that situation, when we start getting these really high pressures, we're probably dealing with something that has a very small volume. And what does that mean? Well, if you put gas molecules in there in a very small volume, a couple of things start to deviate from an ideal situation. And if you remember the two main things that came from the kinetic molecular theory about what makes something an ideal gas is first off, the volume of the gas is very small compared to the container at which it is flying about. In a sort of real gas situation, because the pressure is so high, the volume is so small. Now even this really small guy's volume is significant in that very small overall volume. You know, it's kind of like if you put a, if you put a, um, <clears throat> I guess I want to get the right example here. If you put a, um, a baseball, for example, 
So you take a baseball and you put it in like a, like a round trash can, right? And you put it in there, right? It's going to probably fall to the bottom. But if you take that same baseball and you put it into like, say, a, a plastic cup, like a drinking cup from like a fountain or something like that, and you put it in there, it's probably going to get like stuck on the top, right? And it's going to make like a snow cone type of thing. So the volume of the baseball, when you drop it into, say, like a trash can, not a big deal, right? It flows from there. It's got plenty of volume. But if you make the volume overall small and you put it into like a little cup, now your baseball is going to be stuck. And the volume of the baseball is significant in that case versus the volume of the container at which it's in. And same idea here with these gas molecules, again, just because of the very small volume, the volume of the actual gas molecule now is, is really important. In addition, the other thing that makes something an ideal gas is, again, if you remember, there's no attractive forces or repulsive forces that occur in sort of ideal conditions. And same idea as what we're talking about in these conditions, you got these sort of perhaps very small volumes, which means they are very close to each other, which means, you know, they have no choice but to sort of interact with each other because they're occupying a very small volume. Other case scenario there, if you have really low temperature, you basically got gas molecules that are moving really, really slow, which means when two gas molecules sort of come near each other, they are now going to be near each other for a much longer time than if we were at a much higher temperature where they would just kind of fly right by each other, you know, and not be in the, the vicinity of each other for a very long time. But moving very slowly at low temperatures means that they are going to sort of be near each other for a lot longer time. As they are near each other for a longer time, that's going to allow repulsive forces and attractive forces to basically start to occur in these real gas situations. Any questions on that so far? Now, why do we sort of under most cases and most situations and most problems that we do and most problems that we've seen up to this point sort of assume ideal behavior or ideal gas behavior? That is because if we look at the pressures here on this, for example, graph, that's zero, that's 200 atmospheres. 200 atmospheres, what is normal sort of everyday conditions in terms of pressure? normal standard sort of pressure and everyday sort of conditions of pressure is one atmosphere. And if you look at this chart, one atmosphere is probably like way back over here. And you can see that if we just sort of highlighted sort of where one atmosphere is in terms of pressure and that's kind of normal pressure conditions, even these guys that are really starting to deviate a lot here. If you bring back those lines all the way back to that point, it is behaving very similar to ideal situations. So that's why in normal sort of pressure and temperature situations, you know, we could assume that most gases will basically behave ideally um, because as you can see from that graph, you know, those lines basically all kind of come back to pretty much an ideal situation. It's only when we get these really extreme sort of pressures and temperatures that we start to see some deviation occurs and clearly right obviously that is you know about 200 times the pressure of a normal situation or normal day and stuff like that any questions on that there okay so let's talk a little bit though about these differences between ideal gases and real gases and sort of the differences that we uh, sort of see so as i mentioned before real gases uh, do not behave like ideal gases at high temperatures or low pressures. So remember, those are kind of the two situations. If you just think about the extreme of those situations, very high pressures should result in very small volumes. Very small volumes means that our volume of the gas is going to uh, be significant. They're also going to be very close to each other and a lot more interaction. Secondly, at low temperatures, as I mentioned, they're not going to be moving as fast which means, again, they are going to be near each other for a lot longer time, and we're going to get those attractive forces occur. These, again, are from the kinetic molecular theory um, and the things that basically make something an ideal gas is those two assumptions that we talked about, no attractive forces or attractions between gas molecules, 
and they don't really take up space themselves. They have a negligible volume. But at low temperatures and high pressures, these assumptions are not valid. So we do see some differences in the molar volume. Remember the molar volume of a gas in an ideal situation is 22.414 liters. We start to see some deviations of that here with our molar volumes under those sort of real gas condition, conditions. So when we talk about, so let's come back. We talk about real gases, um, because real molecules really do take up space, the molar volume of a real gas uh, is larger than that predicted by the ideal gas law at high pressures. So the molar volume, again, is at 22.414 liters per mole. It's that conversion that we use at STP. And we see here that uh, in our ideal situation, and our sort of non-ideal situation with argon, you know, at kind of lower pressures, you know, they are really riding in terms of the molar volume pretty close to each other. But as we start building up pretty high pressures, we start to see some deviation occurring. We actually start to see that the argon uh, basically has a little higher um, molar volume than would be predicted sort of by the ideal gas law. So that has an effect on the molecular volume because of this. And because of that, what happened was uh, we have an effect on the pressure. So at high pressures, the amount of space occupied by the molecule is significant compared to the total volume. So this is the idea again, at those high pressures, small volume, the baseball example, throw it into a trash can, it goes right in, throw it into like a paper cup, it's gonna get stuck, right? And if the volume got much smaller, and that's why, uh, the molecule, molecular volume of a real gas would be larger than would be predicted by the ideal gas law. So our guy uh, by the name of Van der Waals, who did a lot of work with sort of uh, intermolecular forces and interactions that occurred, he basically took the ideal gas law and built in some correction values uh, for the differences that we see in a sort of a real gas situation. So the corrected volumes or Van der Waals constants are sometimes referred to, referred to as Van der Waals constants, as you see over there. And there are two constants, A and B. And B here accounts for the difference in every uh, in the molecular volume, and they are different for every gas. So that's an important thing. These are values that you look up in a table and they are different for every gas. So every gas will have some different A and B values, which are Van der Waals constant, kind of taking the ideal gas law and doing a little correction for the volume aspect of it because of this we get nrt which is the same nrt as from the ideal gas law same p our n is moles but again our b is our van der waals constant here again as sort of a correction value for the increase in volume that we see in a real gas situation now at low temperatures as we've been talking about as well we start to see some deviation from an ideal situation and we see that here in this uh, sort of picture. We see that xenon in sort of a real gas situation as the temperature starts to drop. Remember 298 is sort of regular 25 degrees room temperature, but as we get into these lower temperatures, we start to get some of these deviations occurring. And we actually see that xenon has a lower pressure because of that real gas behavior. And that is an effect of basically interactions between the different gas molecules. So we start to see that the pressure starts to sort of drop a little bit here. And that is, as I was talking about before, at these lower temperatures, these gas molecules are moving past each other much slower. So there's gonna be a lot of interaction that's going to occur in these conditions. And again, some of those interactions can have an effect at how fast or how often sort of the gas molecule collides with the container. Again, if there's some attractive forces between these two guys, it's gonna kind of slow this guy down 
and there's going to be sort of less collisions that's going to happen uh, in sort of a real gas situation than you would predict in an ideal gas situation. So Van der Waals came up with sort of a correction value factor for the pressure aspect of it that's affected by low temperatures. So, uh, and that correction value is A, and B again was the correction value for volume. And that's again, sort of incorporated into our ideal gas law NRT over V minus A, which is a value that you look up on the table and over V squared here. And this is a much prettier picture than what I was drawing. But again, under these real situations, we got some attractive forces perhaps or repulsive forces between these guys, but this attractive force is going to affect how often and how fast and how hard, I guess, that those collisions are going to be with the container. Again, those intermolecular forces affecting the pressure as a result of that. So taking all of Van der Waals sort of corrections into account, we get what are sometimes referred to as the Van der Waals equation for real gases or non-ideal gases. And it is a scary looking version of the ideal gas law. And this is Van der Waals correction value here for the pressure is P plus A N squared over V squared. Again, A being Van der Waals constant that you look up on the table, such as this one times V minus NB, again, B being a Van der Waals constant for that correction in volume that you also look up on a table equals NRT. So this is our PV is equal to N, whoops, fancy N. Again, oops, NRT. So this is our ideal gas law. Again, this part, same the built-in sort of correction values are added again into the pressure and volume aspect of it to uh, basically account for those interactions that we see under real conditions, non-ideal conditions of high pressures or low temperatures. As you can see here again, as we talked about, different gases have different values for A and B. And these are again values that you would look up or be provided for you if you needed them. And any questions on sort of Van der Waals equations? Because it really is sort of the ideal gas law just to make sure everybody's on the same page. For the most part, the units that we use for the ideal gas law should obviously still be used here. So pressure should still be in atmospheres, volume should still be in liters and uh, temperature should still be in Kelvin. The only thing I would say is uh, probably not in your situation, or, but you might in a future situation perhaps. You know, if you look up uh, Van der Waals constants in something maybe outside of a textbook, you know, some type of uh, other um, source, sometimes the units, as you can see here, the units that we see in this particular table are liters, atmospheres, moles. So they're, they're kind of the traditional sort of units that we associate with, uh, the ideal gas law and kind of those guys. Uh, sometimes in, in sort of other books or resources, the units are not always those units. So sometimes they use things like, you know, kilopascals or things like that. So you might have to do some conversions, but usually in most textbooks, they'll kind of use the correct units, but you should be aware of the units of these guys if you ever look them up and use them to make sure that they do correspond to the normal atmosphere unit for pressure, liter unit for volume and obviously Kelvin for temperature. So you want to make sure that they do match up to each other. No, you would not have to memorize this table. It would be provided for you because obviously they are different values for different gases. Yeah. You may have to know this equation, but uh, this table would be provided for you, obviously. And that brings us to sort of a, a, a final thought here in terms of gases and and why perhaps, you know, a lot of times, you know, we think of ideal situations, right? And we use the ideal gas law versus say a real gas, right? First off, a couple of reasons why, you know, we kind of uh, will lean towards this. If we look back at that little chart or that little graph, we saw that, you know, for the most part under our normal sort of one atmosphere-ish type conditions in terms of pressure, even those guys that really started to deviate a lot from that, you know, kind of straight line, the very first one that we looked at, 
you know, when you kind of follow those lines back to sort of where our normal pressures and temperatures would be, um, you know, they are behaving pretty close to ideally. And that's why we kind of go roll with this one as well. The other difference is this one is a very specific equation in the sense of, you know, we have different values, right? For A and B for different gases. So if we use this one for helium, we use this one for neon, we use this one for argon, we have some different values here. This one is because most gases under the conditions we normally deal with them sort of behave ideally. This is a more universal sort of formula that can be used to be applied to many different gases without having to take into consideration, you know, those A and B sort of correction values and stuff like that. So um, because, you know, in most cases, you know, if you're doing something, uh, you could think about it as you're probably doing it under that sort of one atmosphere-ish pressure condition and normal sort of room temperature that even, you know, if you have a gas that can in certain situations deviate a lot from ideal um, under those kind of normal conditions, it will probably behave either ideally or very, very close to ideally where we could use the ideal gas law as more of a universal formula uh, to figure out what we need rather than obviously having to go and find these A and B values and stuff like that. If it's definitely a, a real gas situation, non-ideal gas situation, or it's explained to you as one of those things, you definitely should obviously use the Van der Waals equation and again, find the specific values. Um, but again, that's why in most cases, we talk about the ideal gas law and probably why you, you only talked about the ideal gas law in your previous class is because again, these situations, you know, in everyday life probably is, gases will behave more ideally than sort of non-ideally. Any questions on gases? That should wrap up this chapter. That should also wrap up the last material that will be on the exam, which obviously is not today, otherwise we'd be taking it very shortly. Um, but it has been moved right to Tuesday. We're gonna roll with that, give you a little time there to kind of digest some of this stuff. So Tuesday, again, we will take the exam. It will cover from off the top of my head, whatever it says, but I think uh, we're going from basically what was on the quiz. So uh, reactions, equations, balancing redox, uh, stoichiometry, uh, solutions, obviously molarity, titrations, and gases. So those kind of guys, again, homework will be due obviously on Tuesday uh, for that. Any questions on that stuff? Okay, then we're gonna then move on to the next chapter, which is chapter nine. And obviously this stuff here will not be on this exam. It will be on exam number four, which I don't wanna depress you and tell you that it is the following week uh, coming up on that Monday. So uh, we will start here with uh, chapter nine. But the happy thought is two weeks from today, it's all over and this we're done with this class, believe it or not, I think. So, which I guess could be a bad situation as well because two weeks from today means that's the final as well. All right, so uh, we're gonna talk about now the liquid state. We're gonna talk about really uh, some interactions about how uh, molecules interact with each other. We're also gonna talk about uh, specifically, uh, you know, things like water, some of the properties of water. We're gonna end up with a little bit about solids at the end and uh, sort of some ways the solids sort of come together. So let's start with uh, the liquid state and we're gonna start with really intermolecular forces and sort of what those are. We talked a little bit about it, uh, I think the other day, but intermolecular forces are really the forces that hold two molecules together. So two different molecules, two of the same molecules, two different in the sense of one molecule, two molecules, could be the same thing, could be different things, but how they are basically held together are intermolecular forces, basically one molecule and another molecule, how they attract each other basically and are held together uh, through them. They are responsible for things like the condensed states of matter. Uh, they're responsible for things like how high or low something like the boiling point is, uh, the melting point of a solution is affected by the strength of these intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces 
pretty much for the most part, they all basically work the same way. They all basically, as we will talk about, are the basic interaction of positive and negative things being attracted to each other. And what that means is when we have two different molecules, we have a, one side of the molecule that's maybe more positive will be attracted to the more negative side of another molecule. And that gives it a way to interact with one another through that kind of positive and negative attraction that occurs. It affects things like melting point and boiling point because when this bond between these molecules break apart, for example, this guy is now free, it could go into the gas phase, right? Which is what happens at the boiling point. Right? If these two guys break apart, this guy is freer, this guy is freer. This is what sort of happens at the melting point, right? It's in a liquid phase or a little bit more room for movement and stuff like that. Uh, so it does have a, a very important effect. Now, different than that is, as we also, I think, talked about a little bit, is what is referred to as intramolecular forces. Intramolecular forces are the forces within a single molecule that basically holds it together. Um, these are very strong forces. They're usually much stronger than an intermolecular forces. So I think the example perhaps I, I, we've seen before, uh, again, if we look at something, for example, like water, just one individual water molecule, the covalent bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen where they're sharing electrons and the covalent bond between this oxygen and that hydrogen where they're sharing electrons are in intramolecular forces. Now, if you take two water molecules together, and if you remember water is polar, which means the hydrogens are more positive than the oxygens, which are more negative. If we take two water molecules together, which also has positive and negative, the positive hydrogen in one will be attracted to the negative oxygen in another, and that is a intermolecular force. So something like covalent bonding is intramolecular force. Ionic bonding, where two ions come together, is intramolecular forces, right? The positive and negative attraction. And intramolecular forces are always weaker than intramolecular forces. As I might have mentioned before, when you take a pot of water to kind of heat it up and boil it to make some pasta. As you're heating it, the first bond that breaks is right there. Between the two water molecules, you get a water molecule that's free and another water molecule that's free. And that is the steam, right? That you see coming off the pot when it starts to boil. Now we know that's true because if it wasn't and the opposite was true that the intermolecular force was stronger than the intramolecular force, when you would go to heat that water, instead of breaking the bond between the water molecules individually, you would start breaking these bonds, which would then generate hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, which is again, probably not a great thing if you are boiling water with a flame, that is probably not going to be good. Uh, so obviously that doesn't happen. So again, that intermolecular force, always much weaker than any intramolecular force um, within a single molecule. Any questions on that there? So what we're going to focus in on here is actually intermolecular forces. So we're gonna talk about some different intermolecular forces. And first off, just to make sure these are all what we're talking about now are intermolecular force forces. These are all forces between different molecules that hold them together. And as I mentioned earlier, really the basic interaction that we have is the positive side of one will be attracted to the negative side of another, sort of that opposites attract. So the first type of interaction that we have is what is referred to as a dipole-dipole force. And these are forces between polar molecules. So if you remember, when we have a polar molecule, 
we could draw a net dipole moment, right? It's polar. And what does that mean? Well, it means in this case that this side of the molecule would be more negative. This side would be more positive. So when we get two polar molecules together, that has a positive and negative side and a positive and negative side, the negative and positive sides will sort of line themselves up and that gives them a way to interact with each other. And we now have some of the intermolecular forces occurring. As you can see here, we'll have some of those attractive forces basically happening as well. When we get together and a whole bunch of them together, they do try to align themselves in a way that maximizes, especially in the solid state, maximizes the attractive forces between the positive and negative and minimize the repulsive forces between uh, like charges, like positive, positive, negative, negative. But no matter what you do, right, you know, just by pushing everybody together in the solid state because they're really close together, you are going to get some kind of positive areas near positive areas and some negative areas near negative areas. But it will kind of keep moving around and kind of readjusting until it really sort of maximizes that positive negative attraction that occurs as it settles into sort of the solid state. Dipole-dipole interaction are pretty much the intermolecular forces for when you take a polar molecule together with another polar molecule. So it is really sort of the main intermolecular force that occurs when we have two polar molecules basically interacting with one another. And again, that's what we see here. As I mentioned before, no matter what happens sort of in the solid state, we are going to get some negatives and negatives near each other, positives and positives near each other. But again, they will kind of move around to maximize that opposite attraction. And again, kind of minimize that like attraction to occur until they kind of settle into a situation where, you know, they're okay with it and, and that uh, sort of particular example. Another sort of intermolecular force is one that uh, sort of explains why, you know, ionic compounds sort of dissolve in something like water. And, and this is ion dipole force. And much like the name implies, it implies an ion, which means we have a cation or an anion and a dipole, which means we kind of have a polar molecule. And that is again, sort of what happens when you take something like sodium chloride and you dissolve it into water. It breaks apart into a sodium ion that's positively charged, which is attracted to the negative side of water, which is the oxygen side. And obviously it breaks apart into a chloride ion, which is also attracted to water but it's attracted to the positive side, which would be the hydrogens here in water. Badly drawn. For that one. And, you know, this accounts for really what's happening when we dissolve an ionic compound like this. And again, we have our cation, which is positively charged, basically attracted to the negative side of a polar molecule, while we have our anion, which is negatively charged attracted to the positive side of a polar molecule. So we get that positive negative attraction that allows those guys really to come together and dissolve really well as well. Now for equal charges, uh, cations interact more strongly than anions and that's because cations are typically smaller than anions. Right, when something loses electrons and becomes positively charged, it loses those electrons. As the electron cloud gets smaller, the ion is smaller, which allows it to strongly interact with uh, something like water, for example. Now, ionic compounds usually have very low solubility and nonpolar solvents. So, unlike a polar molecule, which obviously has a positive negative side, when we're dealing with a nonpolar molecule, a nonpolar molecule basically is kind of like no charge, right? There's not a side that's more positive. There's not a side that's more negative. 
So when you take your sodium chloride and try to put it into like a nonpolar solution, they have no way to interact with each other. These guys are looking for, for example, the positive guy is looking for something that is negatively charged, which he's not going to find in a nonpolar guy. The negative guy is looking for something that's positively charged, which he's not going to find really in a nonpolar guy. So over a long period of time, they really don't have a way to interact well with each other. And they really won't interact for a long period of time good with each other. As we talked about as well, this is really the process of dissolving. This is why when we put something like sodium chloride in water, it looks like it disappears. It really doesn't disappear. It just gets kind of mixed into all the water molecules that are there. And from our eyes, it disappears. But we know it really didn't go anywhere and it's more of a physical change because again, if we took both of these guys, uh, which would be basically a sodium chloride solution and we heated it, we would basically take out all the water molecules that are there and all the water molecules would evaporate and that would allow those ions to come back together. And again, in our beaker or whatever, we would again see the solid reappear, which would be our solid sodium chloride. So that's why when we talk about sort of dissolving something in water, it is a physical change rather than a chemical change uh, because they're both still there. Although sometimes people think it's a chemical change because you know something disappeared and stuff like that. Another type of intermucker force is actually the one where we do use for sort of nonpolar molecules. And these are what are referred to as dispersion forces. And dispersion forces, for the most part, everybody could do some type of dispersion force, but it is the main sort of intermolecular force for when we take a nonpolar molecule together with another nonpolar molecule. So dispersion forces is really what we use to uh, have two nonpolar molecules basically occur. We can have a, what is referred to as an induced dipole, uh, which is basically creating that positive negative charge in a molecule by the presence of a polar molecule or a ionic molecule. So these are really temporary type of interactions that occur because it needs something to sort of kind of happen for it to occur. So for example, if I had a nonpolar sort of guy has really no separation of charge, but if I sort of cozied up an ion near it for a time being, we would then have this guy going, all right, all the electrons in here are going to go, cool, positive guy, I'm going this way. And the result of that is we will get this kind of temporary induced dipole that occurs and a way for these guys to interact again on a sort of a temporary basis, because as this guy sort of moves away, he's going to go back to his normal neutral uh, situation. Same thing here, obviously, if we had a polar molecule that's sort of mixed up to something that's nonpolar. Again, the electron distribution in that guy that's normally nonpolar over here will now have a temporary sort of charge and interaction that occurs. So if you think about like, for example, oil and vinegar sort of salad dressing or something like that, right? And uh, oil is typically nonpolar. Vinegar, which is acetic acid, has a polar aspect to it. And when you mix up the salad dressing, right, for, for a little bit of time, they mix, right? They stay together, again, through this sort of temporary sort of attraction. But when you put the bottle of salad dressing down on the table, eventually what happens is you start to see everything basically layer out. So what we're talking about here with sort of dispersion forces is they can sort of interact with each other, but it is sort of temporary. It's got to create kind of new interactions to maintain that. And definitely when we sort of introduce something that's polar or ionic with something that's nonpolar, it can perhaps only interact for a very short period of time before it has no real long way, Ray, or long time way of interacting with one another and maintaining that interaction. And that's why they sort of separate apart from each other. Now, another 
way in which we can actually get some interaction occurring between actually two nonpolar molecules is by what is referred to as an instantaneous dipole. And so for example, if we had two nonpolar molecules near each other, they absolutely have no charge at this point. But there's this idea of what is referred to as polarizability, which is basically the ease at which the electrons, which are flying around in each of these cases, have the ability to basically get distorted and moved over to one side versus the other. So just instantaneously, if all the electrons in this particular guy decided to all take a vacation to the left-hand side of the molecule, that would temporarily create a negative charge on the left-hand side and a positive charge on the right-hand side of this molecule. And now if that guy is still hanging out near the other nonpolar molecule, the electrons in this guy are gonna go, cool, positive, I'm going this way. And now the distribution of electrons in the guy on the right has now changed. And now these two guys that started out with really no charge because of those kind of swinging and distortion of those electrons now have a positive side and a negative side where they can again sort of temporarily interact with each other. And that is what is referred to really as an instantaneous dipole. And that is really how nonpolar and nonpolar uh, sort of molecules are able to interact with each other. Now, the degree at which this can occur actually is affected by the size. The larger the number of electrons, which means the higher the molar mass, means more molar mass, more electrons, means that when you have a compound, the strength of this dispersion force actually gets stronger with molar mass. So the strength of dispersion force gets stronger with the molar mass. So, you know, something that uh, maybe like CH4, for example, would interact with CH4 would not be as strong as say something like C4H10, C4H10. Again, these guys, a lot more electrons here, greater chance of those electrons being distorted, greater areas and more areas where electrons and electrons kind of that distortion can occur and interaction can occur with each other, creating that uh, stronger sort of bond that will occur. Any questions on that there? All right, so we will stop here for now.